All right. So I remember going back, I don't know, it was probably seven or eight years ago, and it was an annual meeting. There's this guy, his name was Lawrence Carroll, uh, and he was speaking uh, before a group. I think it had to be about 100, 150 people, maybe even more. And great speech was tremendous. And in the middle of it, or maybe in the beginning of it, uh, he decided to ask everyone to go into this group meditation. And it lasted, it was, it was pretty, pretty long. It wasn't like a 90 second thing. <laughs> it was like 20 minutes, 30 minutes and 150 people. If you can imagine, you could hear an absolute pin drop. And, um, and that really made an impact on me. I, I remember, and not only was everyone pretty much transfixed to every word that this man had to say thereafter, but, um, but they were truly present. They were truly present. So, uh, Lawrence, man, you know, you, you, you've made an impact on me, even if it was a small impact, uh, over the years. Uh, so it's great to have you, man. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, Oh yeah, I I know, I know what you're talking about now. I was I was thinking somewhere else, but yeah, yeah, that was uh, uh, it's a Porchlight was... VNA annual meeting. And, yeah, uh, and I remember I was like, are, he's really going to do this. He's <laughs> really going to do this. And there's people they're having wine and they're having dinner and everything. <laughs> and man, it was good. It was good. I remember the, the service staff coming out, and I was they were banging some door in the background, and I was like. <laughs> I thought, oh, this is not going to work, <laughs> but it sounds like something landed, at least for you. So that's great. Oh, for sure. And, you know, I think it, it speaks to the power of meditation, mm -hmm. um, you know, because we're being bombarded all the time in today's day and age, now, you know, pandemic and war aside, just on a regular basis, we're being imposed upon dramatically and, uh, our minds are being uh, driven all the time and, and we're in a thought world and, you know, to be able to sit back and realize that we're bigger than our, our brains even, and we have to step outside of that. That's, that's something that um, is an evolution for people. And I think it's, a, it's almost like a deep programming that we have to do. Yeah. I mean, you're touching on some big issues here. You're going kind of, deep straight away there's no <laughs> mucking around here is there okay so yeah i mean you're taking on the human condition and the uh the ancient enlightenment teachings uh, all in one sentence <laughs> let's get right into it man. <laughs> yeah okay no bush beating around the bush here uh yeah it's unusual to come across someone asking at the level that you're you're talking about really i mean often there's a there's a packaging of meditation and mindfulness as it'll help your school grades or it'll drop your blood pressure you know it's logically you know the the scientific studies will show the end result of meditation as something that's fairly good for your mental and perhaps physical health you'll see sports uh, professionals starting to move into meditation for better focus on the field and uh, so it's kind of got all these little packages. And you, and you have to do that because in order to sort of sell it, you have to, you have to sell it in the, this 3D world we have and like, yeah. okay, lower blood pressure. Sure, that's, that's a good, that we can check that box off or better focus or doing better. You know what I'm saying? Because, because, it, because that's the world that, we're, that people see, this, this world that where it's, you know, three-dimensional, I'm in a body, I'm in, you know, I have this table in front of me and, and that's the world we're living in. So, um, so yeah, you, you, you got to do that, but there, there are on that level, an incredible number of benefits for sure. Yeah. And the way I see it is when we start to go into the, the depth of meditation um, and where it's uh, really coming from in the human psyche um, and the experience of meditation, um, I tend to think uh, that kind of logic of seeing starting from the end point and working backwards is putting the cart in front of the horse. And, and it often leads to a lot of misunderstandings about what meditation is. So on the one hand, yes, we get it out there, you know, palatable, um, sellable fashion. But on the other hand, it, there's a lot of people who get very confused by what is this thing and what, what am I supposed to do? And they're looking for particular outcomes 
to prove that they're successful or not. So there's this whole, oh, I can't do it because I'm not getting X, Y, or Z. And so um, a lot of the work I do is to try and help people experience success at a foundational level and get a different orientation slightly to the package. Mm, so tell me about, okay, you have that conversation about meditation. So you said a lot of people don't understand necessarily what it is or how to do it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, in a lot of ways, it's not complicated. It's not easy. Those are two very different things. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's can be a very simple process, but, um, but it doesn't make it an easy process. Uh, that's why they call it a practice, right? Yeah. And I think <laughs> the, um, the fact that it's not easy is because the skill set for meditation uh, is a skill set that's not really acknowledged as necessarily, um, I don't know, CV worthy. All right. So your curriculum vitae, you know, if you had your skill set for meditation, you know, an employer would look at it and say, yeah, well, so what? <laughs> I don't need those skills. And, and that's, you know, and that's, uh, I think, part of these skills aren't acknowledged by teachers and not acknowledged by parents, employers. So the skill set for meditation is often overlooked as a skill set that's not that worthy of attention. And, and that's why we're not trained in it. It, it is challenging because we, we're, everything else we do, especially being on cell phones and iPads where our attention is constantly being bombarded by information and fragmentation, it, these skill sets do become challenging to repossess mm. uh, and re-inhabit as, as we've grown older and further away from them. <laughs> because how do you... How do you justify 20 minutes of meditation in the morning or, and, or 20 minutes in the afternoon in your work day? That's not efficient. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. What a waste of time, right? What, what, what a waste of time, right? You know, that, that, and, and, but this, but this is the sort of matrix we're, we're living in. I, but I think there are a lot of people who are waking up. Um, I was just having a conversation the other day, right on the podcast where, it was like, what are we doing? You know, what we go to work every day, we work eight hours for this company or what have you, but like, what are we doing? Like, why are we doing this? You know, and is there a why? And have we actually thought about that? Yeah, well, and this is again, where you're, you're kind of diving into the, you're going past the packaging format of meditation <laughs> and you're diving into bigger questions that, uh, uh, that meditation, when you dive into the practice, will start to bubble up as well because you start to develop an introspective muscle and you'll, you'll start to question things and, and the questions are often a little unfathomable, uh, sometimes impossible to answer uh, in, a, in a way that the logical mind would be satisfied. So a lot of our insights uh, from meditation are often... Um, more aesthetic than logical they're, they're, they're more you know how do you rationalize a beautiful sunset for instance there's there's a different part of your humanity that's activated often through meditation which like i said doesn't go so well on the cv but in terms of your own fulfillment as a human being it can in the end on your deathbed be the very thing you wish you had to spend more time with mm. What would you what would be a start for someone? So if you're working with someone and you work with clients uh, mm -hmm. all the time, you work with organizations. Yeah. Um, you know, what are some of the first few steps for uh, people who are listening to our podcast? And you know, maybe maybe they're like, uh, I don't really know what these guys are talking about, or right. maybe maybe they're getting an inkling and they're kind of thinking, you know what? Some of that resonates with with me. Mm -hmm. um, there's there's something to this. So you know, what would some of the first steps people would, would want to take uh, to sort of explore this further? Uh, well, one of the first steps I like to give people is a fantastic experience of meditation. One where they go, okay, yeah, wow, that was something, hmm. right? Where they actually have the taste. 
you know, it's a bit like you can't intellectualize the taste of chocolate, right? So if you tell someone how good chocolate is and you go into all the intellectual jargon, they're not going to know what the hell you're talking about. But a really good taste of meditation is a great start. And then once they've had the taste, then to offer them some very practical guidelines to set up their own practice. And, those, and that practice needs to be attainable, realistic, manageable, so that they feel, oh, I can do that. So they've got the inspiration from the taste, and then they've got the inspiration from a very doable, fitting into their schedule kind of timeline. And then a little bit of information outside of that, like different types of practices they might find, um, which ones to choose, where do you meditate, when do you meditate, what are the optimal conditions for meditation. And that way they come away with a sense of, okay, I've got enough to go with here. I've got enough to start with. Hmm. And that's what I want to leave people with is, one, the inspiration, two, the doability of starting their own practice. Hmm. And, and the sense that they've got resources and support out there that um, they can follow up with if they get stuck or have a question. Hmm. And so meditation to you, what, is, what does that look like? What, what, you know, where are you sitting? You know, what time of day? And of course, I, I suppose for anyone, it could be any time of day. It doesn't have to be necessarily a particular time. But, um, but what it, from your perspective, because I know there's a lot of folks who have different ideas of what meditation is, and there right. are different kinds of meditation. Right. Uh, but what does it look like to, to you? Well, on a, on a practical basis, I would recommend that you, you do the practice when your brain is soft. Now, brain, brain softness isn't something easily attained. Once you get into emails, once you get into business, <laughs> your brain starts to harden up. I, I, this is the, the description I like to use. Mm. So I find the brain is most soft after a good rest. So maybe after waking up in the morning, before you get going into all the emails, you, you've still got that kind of soft atmosphere around the brain it can get a little soft towards the end of the night when you're ready for bed but usually at that time the the enemy here is tiredness and mm -hmm. we don't want to fall asleep so the goal for meditation is not to fall asleep but to experience a, a heightened sense of alertness uh, a more sensitive space and if we're tired at the end of the day, that's unlikely. The chances are you're just going to nod off and become unconscious. So traditionally, dawn and dusk were the times where people meditated. Uh, so I come back to at least dawn is a great, a great time. That's when I do my practice. Uh, I do it before my coffee. I used to have my coffee first, then the practice. But now I've switched the, yeah. the order. Hmm. I, yeah. And actually that's, that's a, a good, good little tip uh, for folks because even uh, uh, biologically, you know, our body sort of wakes up naturally. Uh, so to give the artificial caffeine before that process mm. happens kind of teaches your body that now you're needing that caffeine to, to get mm. there. So, um, so I've, I've held off on, I drink, I, still drinking coffee, but, um, but that doesn't happen, you know, for me personally, and it seems to work out, um, until after a couple hours after, uh, being up. But, um, one thing a lot of people do is have their cell phones next to them. They use it as their alarm clock. Mm -hmm. So it's there, it's omnipresent. As we know, it is ubiquitous in our world. So what do we do with the phone? Um, you know, it sounds to me like the first thing you do when you wake up should not be <laughs> to, to check uh, social media, to check your email and, and all the rest. I, that may be kind of an obvious thing <laughs> for people logically, but, but everyone, not everyone, a lot of people do it for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think you're going to discover a lot of paradoxes in this journey of meditation. And one is the, the, the cell phone or the, the watch, the iWatch, you know, they, they, they can be really great timekeepers. Sure. You can have music on them or guided meditations on them. So you're using them for the very purpose of um, staying off them. Sure. Um, and, and of course, the, the overuse and overstimulation from our time on our devices is creating uh, a lot of issues, mental health issues. You know, we have fragmented attention. 
when I was teaching at Taconic High School, I would guess somewhere in the vicinity of 40, 50% of the kids would be on some kind of medication to help their attention. So they had attention deficit syndromes all over the place. And the, the, the constant um, alertment from the phone, whether it's a buzz or a ding, et cetera, is constantly putting us into a little bit of adrenaline state of fight and flight. So we're constantly being prodded. Yeah. And, um, and in terms of a climate for learning, that really does uh, dull down the classroom experience and often makes it feel quite unsafe. Mm. And this is where meditation paradoxically wants to create the opposite effect to that. Mm. And, and I, I think also um, there's kind of a, a, a tone you hear that's uh, a little bit almost uh, moralistic in some ways where people, you know, bemoan it. Oh, people are on their phones and, and they're, they're not uh, present and so forth. So you'll, you'll hear that. But then at the same time, time we have a society that has created an expectation yeah. that this is what is happening so and, and and you can and you can run that all the way down to the foods we eat mm. um you know the healthiness of the things that we do with our technology and, and so on and so forth you know uh so we're there's a, some really powerful headwinds that we have mm. in society as you know, the, the framework is not one that necessarily uh, encourages uh, presence, encourages healthiness mm. and, and these kinds of things. So mm. it, it has to be intentional. It has to be something that you carve 20 minutes out of your morning to be able to do this without the phone and, and so on and so forth. Or if you're just using the phone for a timer, <laughs> um, yeah. you know, with, with a little bell that goes off, ding, you know, yeah. um, that sort of thing. But you, you, in, in this world, you need to have that intention to cut through mm. what society is delivering to us in a lot of ways. Yeah. Well, again, you'd like to dive <laughs> deep here, mate. Um, um, yeah. I, and I would say the, the very first skill of meditation that I teach people is to become still. Now, as soon as people hear, hear that word, they, they start to balk. So I say, okay, well, you don't really know what being still means. So let's, let's break that down into very uh, doable skills, right? And that stillness becomes a metaphor for the determination you're speaking to. It's the determination, I will do this. I will not be moved. I will be like a strong tree. And so that commitment, that dedication is part of the stillness process. Right? So no matter what thought comes into my mind, I'm not going to move. I'm not going to fidget or scratch. And that is a powerful Thing to be able to do, you know, I mean, yeah. that is, you know, we talk about willpower, willpower or strength um, to overcome uh, your mind. And, and again, your mind sometimes is something that is not the enemy, but is a challenge in this because to be still and mindfulness also uh, means that you have to step out of the mind in a way. Well, one thing I try to help people distinguish is there's a lot of conceptions out there that meditation is about having a quiet mind. Mm. And I say, no, 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 no. The thoughts, all this stuff, this chaos of all these thoughts and the thinking process is not the problem. What is the problem is the reaction to that. This is where meditation is practicing not reacting to the overwhelming content of the mind so you become still so my mind's going oh gee when's this interview going to finish i, I really need to go to the bathroom i need to scratch my nose so this is all blah 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 blah, blah in the head but i'm practicing stillness as one of the skills there's three skills all together but one of the skills is not to react Right. So I'm just practicing not reacting to that, not getting into a narrative or a drama and trying to build out a whole story around some impulse or some thought that's jumped into the mind. And that stillness is say, okay, no matter what happens, boom, I'm not going to move. 
right? And that's and that is a metaphor for being determined, mm. right? Mm -hmm. So, and we're not trained to be still. We we're, we're trained to be distracted, right? We, right. Oh, what the cell phone? Oh God! Oh, I've got to look. Oh, ping, ping. I've got to figure out something's over there. I've got to turn. I've got to scratch because I've got an itch. Yeah. So what we're doing is practicing. Okay, stop reacting for a moment and see what mm. happens. Mm. Will you? Will you die? <laughs> <laughs> you might not die, right? So you practice and you practice, and that muscle gets strong, and then that pra that practice of being still turns into a quality of character called steadiness. Mm. You become steady. You know, when people are freaking out all over the place, you, your experience is a steadier state. And that means you're le reacting less to things. Mm. And that becomes a quality which for an employer would be a nice thing to see on the CV. <laughs> <laughs> He has steadiness and he can, uh, or she can, can prove that because of the work that they've done. I, you know, and so, and so there you go. So there is the, um, the real world quote unquote application to something like that. And, and, you know, and, mm. and again, like I said, many different approaches to meditation, you know, some, you know, would say, okay, you know, picture is your, these thoughts pop into your head, allow them to melt away and overcome it or, you know, have, you know, have these visuals, oh, this thought has now popped in my head and so forth. But that stillness is, it seems to me like that, that consistency, because it leads to attention, mm, you yeah. know, attention mm -hmm. on that one thing that you're doing, you and I were having this one thing, this conversation, you know, and, and so sure. forth, you know, the, like you said, lots of things, you know, the cameras flipping back and forth, you know, all that. But like, at the end of the day, it's, it's the conversation. So if you're sitting at Dottie's or wherever you are, you know, there's a lot of things happening, but to have that full attention on the person you're with, right. uh, to have that full attention on your children when you're spending time with them, uh, right. you know, right. uh, or your significant other or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. These are all things that, uh, you know, are impactful in our lives in the value and, and, and the quality, I should say, for sure of our, of our relationships Correct. every single day. Correct. So meditation on the mat is meditation off the mat. You, you, they become indistinguishable. Once those muscles start to develop, then it, it, it's, it's, you know, inescapable that the way you live your life is going to reflect what you've created in that mental, emotional stability is, is, is there. Mm. Um, and it may be not be everybody's cup of tea. Not everybody might like you to be mentally and emotionally more stable. They might think you're becoming um, less human, but mm. I would argue, no, you're becoming more human because you're, you're, you still have the things coming into your mind that push your buttons and make you want to react, mm -hmm. but you just, you just not reacting in the way that you would create further dis you know, disruption to people or, or further disharmony by your reaction now being part of the, right. the ongoing ripple effect. Yeah. And, 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 you know, you raise a good point because as you go through a pro and we, we all have our own process, you know, we have our lives, we have mm, this right. journey. Um, you know, some people believe that we, you know, have something that is, is supposed to be what we do in life. Um, and, and there's a true purpose. And maybe that was even decided even before we came here, you know, there's, there's, there's all, all kinds of different uh, mm -hmm. thoughts mm -hmm. and philosophies about that, you know, but when it comes down to it, as you go through your process and, you know, we talk about the thing called vibration, we all have a, you know, a certain vibration. If, you know, if we're not matching with other people, there, there's a good chance that people will disappear from your life, <laughs> you know, over mm -hmm. time, people who mm -hmm. may not align, you know, with you in that way. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's okay, though. Y yeah, and it depends what the person wants. Like I have a client at the moment, he, he's, he's, he's only 14, but he's very mature. Right. And he's struggling since COVID, you know, he's spent a lot of isolation time. And now when he's reintegrated with his friends, he's found that the, the level at which he's mm. trying to seek companionship and friendship and understanding it's, it's not being met at this point. So he's, 
he's he's the first thing he the first conclusion he's drawn is there's something wrong with him mm. and the, then what he's seeking in the coaching is how do i find friends that i can resonate with that so people start to seek out their ilk their their tribe because uh because they are wanting to find something that resonates with that vibration whereas other people they just they'll put up with that they'll sacrifice that to just fit in and be part of a an easier ecosystem of friendships mm. so we like you said we're all on our own journey we're all trying to find out what's the the fit here um is it massive compromise and i just fit in with everybody and that's okay which you know for many people is enough and oh, you know the only reason i came to meditation is that model didn't work for me at a certain point i had enough adversity to say eh, i got to do something else i got to find out some other answers here so often adversity is really what kicks us out of the nest yeah and it's hardship and and um things like that that can really shape who we become sometimes the universe really kicks your yeah, ass yeah 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 <laughs> hey, absolutely and, and you need it because you know you, you you haven't necessarily learned that lesson uh before and and, mm -hmm. and didn't really finish the curriculum as it were yeah. and the universe is saying hey uh mm -hmm. yeah we're gonna double down um but uh <laughs> so there's a couple of things i wanted to hit on from what you were just saying mm -hmm. that is uh how people are uh, coming out of the pandemic, um, it's kind of like, as we all are all, you know, metaphorically coming back into the sunlight, uh, and, and so on, um, and, and being able to readapt. That's one thing. But the other thing is, I, I want to ask you how you got started in this. You, you just alluded to it, that, uh, you went through some ad adversity, but, uh, tell me about how you became, uh, Lawrence Carroll, who, who you are today. Um, and we got time, we got time. You can yeah, tell me, you can yeah. tell me the story, um, <laughs> you know, how, how you got to, uh, become what you are and, and, and what you do for, for a living. Well, yeah. Great. Great question. I mean, I, I started off with a pretty cookie cutter um australian upbringing and i uh, was a surfer i i loved my being outdoors i loved the sports uh, i became a school teacher high school math teacher i had a great mentor in high school i helped introduce uh, school surfing into the australian school system nice. which was, yeah that was a that was a, a great time so that decade from my 20s i gotta get some, I gotta get some photos uh from back those early days <laughs> you hang in 10 you know, <laughs> oh yeah gee I, I wish i i wish you know the amount of the way we photograph these days is so accessible back in those days it was a big deal to to bring out a camera and set it up on the beach oh, and I bet. take some shots i think there's a couple of me uh that um i remember them but i i don't know where they are um so that, that decade from my 20s to my 30s, graduating high school, becoming a high school teacher, it was, it was, it was satisfying. I was, I was liking it. It felt, okay, this is a routine. And then I fell in love. I met this gorgeous woman. She was a surfer and she was like, okay, she likes camping. She likes going surfing. Oh my God, this is it. And uh, I was head over heels in love with her. And Unfortunately, she had other plans. She, she wanted to travel the world and kind of not have a, a routine existence. And so I was at the stage of letting her go when she developed a, uh, or she, or what emerged was she had a brain tumor. She mm. had a massive brain tumor and she had a very short period of time to live. So I stayed with her for as long as I could, but she still wanted to leave and do her thing in those last few months of her life. And those that culminated in a sense in me, mm, the fairy tale of life just isn't quite right. And that started me off on a, a spiritual quest. I left teaching abruptly, left my friends and family, uh, started traveling the world, seeking out answers to questions i wasn't satisfied with and that led me to the next uh, two decades 20 years on the on the road so to speak living in spiritual communities wow. uh, exploring going to india 
Europe, uh, Indonesia. So it was a, it was a big, big journey. So I didn't get the, the marriage and the kids and, and the families going, but I missed all that. Um, but I developed a lot of skills in these other areas. And I came back to teaching in 2006. And I started teaching in the Berkshires. I was living in America at that point. Mm. So suddenly, after all this kind of monastic existence, I was back in the classroom. <laughs> and boy, was it a culture shock. <laughs> well, okay. So you go back there. And of course, uh, it was like, you needed to do all that mm. to maybe be the teacher that you could be, I'm, I'm sure. Mm. But now going back to the spiritual journey, you went to India. Mm. Uh, of course, that's, that's the, you know, that's the classic location right. where, you know, if you're the guru or you're following mm -hmm. or, you know, or going through this, you know, you got to go to India, right? Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> but, 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 but tell me, <laughs> right? Like, what you didn't, you know, you did a spiritual journey and you didn't go to India, come on, yeah. you know, but you know, tell me like the philosophies and, and, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, what, you know, what struck you and, and how one step led to another, you mm -hmm. know, from one location to a, another, was it, was it like, okay, this is the sort of next step, uh, mm -hmm. you know, after mm -hmm. you go to India, you go to, you know, this village or, or mm -hmm. that, um, what, what, what was that like? Wow, that's a great question. I mean, and how many years? How many years is that? Uh, uh, well, I, I spent a good twenty years wow. uh, of, of of progression, and it was progression when I look back retrospectively. And uh, like many progressions, I can see um, some of the stages. Um, um, I can appreciate more in retrospect. I, I missed a lot as I, I went through that and I go, I look back and say, Oh, actually there was a lot more going on than mm. what I was absorbing at that time. But fundamentally the, the, the first sequence for me was um, not being so serious. Right. I had to let go of all my drama that I, you know, that fair enough, I'd had the adversity and there was a lot to, you know, but I was, I was kind of locking myself down into a kind of dramatic uh, implosion. And so the first guru was uh, con the, probably all my gurus to some degree have been controversial. All right. And, uh, and I think people who would look at me and ask me about these experiences often think, wow, what was, what was up with him? <laughs> you know, he's, he's kind of lost it up here. You know, how did he get so deluded to be, swayed by gurus and from a certain perspective i get that totally all right I, I i understand why people would say you know how could you surrender your autonomy to to kind of fit into a community and, mm. and it's it's a mindset that we're um understandably a lot of us re are reluctant to entertain we don't want to be absorbed and controlled and brainwashed etc um but when you're in on the other side, you, you see a different kind of expansion. You go, oh, okay. The way I've been looking at my individualism is actually being contracted. And now I'm starting to see we're not separate. We're connected. Hmm. That we have to work together. And that requires a whole different mindset. Right? It's not just about me getting on and being su successful with my unit. But this unit is part of a lot more. Right. So the first guru, the, the collective consciousness as yeah, it were yeah. and, and, and for real. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you start to see, you know, whichever side of the fence you are, you see the, the pros and cons you say, okay, not my cup of tea. I'm not going to cross that line. Um, but I did, I crossed those lines and at the age of 67, I feel very blessed to have, have crossed those lines to have, expose myself to those that lifestyle and i feel it's more grounded me now to be normal again mm. so to speak mm. and so when i came back to teaching i i had all these experiences um 
and I was in the classroom and how am I going to be normal <laughs> with, with what's going on here? And that was a big, big step. But basically the progressions, the first one was less, be less serious, enjoy, just appreciate what's going on around you, letting go of the idea there's something wrong. All right. That was huge. Uh, and be be playful, and that was that was very liberating. Be playful in the sense that you're trying to be more conscious. Mm. Right? And then the second stage was a, a deeper level of um, experiencing what some would call no mind, or uh, I am free from my mind. That the the thoughts and feelings and impulses i'm experiencing there's a whole other dimension of living experience where that doesn't touch and that was really profound but really confused me i got very confused in that stage i was like wow how do you live normally if you if you mm. if all this stuff is if you can actually enter a, a an experience that's free of all that how do you live in that world where everything's constructed from that mm. so that was very confusing and that was a, a shorter journey the first journey, part of the journey was four years the second part was two years different teacher different part of india more traditional teacher and then the the third teacher is where the penny dropped he brought that dissociation together with association mm. how do you live in the world but not of the world and that was that was really this is it this is what i had to put into the the puzzle mm. and so for the next 13 years i i was in that community and um and with all the experiences there's a state of expansion and liberation and then there comes a point where it feels like, oh, I can't keep going this way. It's, something's not right. I'm, I'm starting to convolute again and crash in on myself. Mm. And that's when the next opportunity suddenly reveals itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, it's funny how it does that. Yes. It really is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, when, when you're ready, you know, like they say, well, when, you know, when you're ready, the teacher will appear or the, mm -hmm. or, or what mm -hmm. I think that's just generally uh, how this world kind of works and, you know, mm, and, and, mm. um, and, and actually there's a lot of science actually that, that backs a lot of this, you know, we don't necessarily acknowledge it, but, um, but even the CIA says we live in a hologram, you know, and, and that sort of thing. So there, there's, there's all kinds of studies that talk about the power of mindfulness and, um, intention and, and so forth, but, uh, go, go do your research folks on that. But this whole thing of living, and this is just like, you know, living, you know, in the world, not, but not of the world. I love, I love that, uh, you know, concept, um, because I think really that's the, the paradox we are, because, you know, we are here, we have bills to pay, we have, right. you know, families to feed and right. we have, uh, obligations. And yet we know well, many, I think do know that, you know, we are greater than the flesh, you know, we're greater than, um, this human existence that, mm. that we see in the three-dimensional world. And I just, I think it's, it's when, when you kind of get there, um, you begin to find greater peace and also in this sort of fear-based world, maybe, mm. maybe we kind of, uh, uh, shield ourselves from, mm. from a lot of this, uh, these messages, uh, and there's a lot of fear out there, um, which of course leads to the pandemic. And yet yeah, that's one of the things I'm sure you deal with, uh, with people right now. And it's, right. it's as people are sort of coming out of it. And you talked about this, um, young man, uh, who's, uh, trying to deal with a situation, a social, you know, who, who, who is my, uh, who is my ilk, who, you know, what is my tribe? Um, I think a lot of us after this two plus year process or two year process, at least, now, um, did do a lot of soul searching, did maybe make many changes and now are realizing, wow, um, as we try to get back together socially, first of all, mm. there's a whole situation where we're kind of traumatized by, oh, can we be near each other? Do we have to be six feet away from each other? Mm. I'm so used to wearing masks. And, and so that mm. became a, has become, uh, that, that a, a whole other a process of it but um but i think people changed over the last two years 
Yes, I agree. And a lot of my clients that I'm seeing either as yoga students, meditation students, or life coaching clients uh, are expressing, you know, they are, uh, how can I say it? They are starting to almost like come back to basics. Like, wow, I haven't moved my body for two years. I'm completely, I've let it go. And mm. the things I used to do on a, you know, go to the gym regularly and keep that part of my life gone. I've let it go and I've become someone else and it's got, it's got issues now. It's, it's not right. And I want to reconnect to some of the, the basics, eat well, sleep well, um, be fit, be able to go for walks with my family, um, focus. And so you see people just coming back to the skills once again, that they aren't, that have served them to be successful. But when we get successful, we, we forget that these skills got us there mm. and that it, and coming back to the basics and nourishing the basics allows us to sustain that sense of success and productivity. And so people start to see, oh, self-care actually helps me prolong being a good grandma or a good father or a good employee because that i'm taking care of myself not a, from a selfish well i'm doing this exclusive to the the world but it serves me in what i'm good at or what i <laughs> to me it's amazing uh to me how in our culture you know self-care is such a uh you know it's, it's a protest it's like it's like no it it, it uh, it's actually very logical you know yeah, it's very yeah. difficult to care for other yeah. people if you uh haven't uh, taken care of yourself and you're not in the best yourself that you can be <laughs> yeah that, isn't that amazing <laughs> yeah no, well you know it <laughs> is I, no no judgment it just is it's just kind of like the our culture yeah and, and we we're, we're taught from a very young age to fragment so we see okay self-care is here work is here family is here as if they're all separate units mm. right and what we're we're starting to do is go oh widening the blinkers as we go into things like mindfulness and meditation and we start to see oh they're not all separate there's a there's an interrelatedness that is the picture it's not uh, you know it's it's what really keeps the whole fabric together is the the interrelatedness of things mm. and if we jump over the interrelatedness and see them all as fragmented pieces then our our vision of life is is jarred it's it's just like rigid and it feels like well i can't do both mm -hmm. i've got to do this can't do that you know and then there's a there's an emotional binding to i don't have time for this i don't have energy for that you know it's like I've got to let the baby go with the bathwater. We've become very good, or many of us have become very good at what we call compartmentalizing. Yes. And compartmentalizing isn't necessarily healthy. <laughs> it may it may work because because it works. That's that's what, that's what it's there for. But um, but it doesn't make it good for you uh the soul or your health uh to be honest with you um yeah i mean we're we're all <laughs> it's all a big we're all together in this right yeah and i think men particularly are good at compartmentalizing and uh i don't know if you've seen there's a great show uh great skit where the men have this nothing box <laughs> have you seen that one so we have a box for everything everything's compartmentalized all nicely tidied and but there's one box that's the men's favorite is the nothing box. It's like just empty. And we, <laughs> and we love that box. So we love to spend time. <laughs> Whereas, you know, and, and I, I sometimes think that's why I see so many women in the yoga studios. So many women come to yoga or Pilates or meditation or fitness. And a lot of the, there's a, not so many men, right? Even, even now, decades in. I see more and more men, but I, I still think that there's a tendency for the, uh, the women to find self-care as part of their understanding of nourishing and taking care of perhaps children and others. Mm. Maybe. I mean, I'm getting out of my realm here into a 
a different realm. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, it, it, well, yeah, it's it's for definitely, and I and I think you know, and especially when something seems to be predominantly women, you know, men may feel not so comfortable like hopping in and being the the one guy and there's, you know, you know, 15 other women or something in a yoga class or that sort of thing, but yoga. Okay. So, you know, let's talk about, do you teach yoga classes as well? I do. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so uh, tell me a little bit about that um, yoga and, and it's uh, connection and meditation, you know, uh, it's all a big, you know, yoga is not my thing. Um, um, maybe a few down, downward dogs to stretch out my back in the morning, but, um, but aside <laughs> from that, uh, you know, tell me about yoga practice. Yeah. Well, yoga practice is interesting because if you look historically, yoga practice goes back several thousand years, right? And its intention was to develop core strength, an open flexibility for you to breathe more um, easily and to sit for long periods of time in meditation. So it was a scientific methodology to help you be still, relaxed and open to increase consciousness. And originally they're designed to help you become self-actualized. So that was its traditional background. So it was less gymnastic than a lot of the yogas that are out there today. Mm. The gymnastic martial arts. Not so much hot yoga as it were. Well, hot yoga, vinyasa flow, all these, these, these very fast moving yogas started to enter the arena probably 150 years ago. Mm. And that came in when India was trying to find a national identity. So each country had its national sport, you know, cricket or tennis or gymnastics and India chose yoga, but yoga at that point was for a world, for a world, um, <laughs> you know, uh, looking good on the world stage wasn't really what it was. So there was a, an infusion of incorporating many new parts to yoga, gymnastic parts and martial arts parts and, um, so yoga started to blossom into a whole mm. new creature mm. to be so, respectable. So it could be ready for prime time. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, so we could we ready could, for their close up. <laughs> we could say, you know, on the world stage, man, we we are the leaders. <laughs> now that, but it was also under the influence of this ancient lineage. So there's this kind of confluence of modern day needs with this ancient. Um, tradition so there's this kind of melding starting to take place and then westerners start to come in and they want they get intrigued mm. they 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 like this sense of something's there that's beyond the physical more the spiritual mental stability that we talked about with meditation or mm. the pranayama the breath and they start to get wow this is really quite something and it's somewhat unique to all these other things i do mm. So then the West starts to, um, I guess, bastardize that and they take it back to, to <laughs> how do we country. screw everything up over here? How, why, why is that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I like to say you bring it back to America and suddenly there's the whole entertainment thing. It becomes yeah. goat yoga, beer yoga, naked yoga, um, you <laughs> name it yoga. And, and you just, it's suddenly going in a million different directions. <laughs> <laughs> and within all of that, there is some of the more traditional uh, uh, biased teachers. And there's some who are just, it's a hot yoga class. You know, we're going to crank up the heat and you'll be in and out of here, ready for work, drenched to the bone. And, <laughs> you know, so you have this, this wide spectrum of what we call yoga these days. And I, in my training, I was more centered to the, the yoga meditation enlightenment kind of model. And since I've been working, I, I've had to open my, my peripheral vision to mm. all these other types. But it's good for you <clears throat> to be the one as the sort of practitioner of some of these, because at least you're holding the roots um, into some of these 
spinoffs, as it were, uh, because I hope know. so. <laughs> I, mean, well, I hope so. <laughs> I'm sure you're trying anyway. <laughs> yeah, I, I am. And uh, it's not everybody's cup of tea. You know, some people are only there for the sweat, the DNA and uh, losing DNA. And there's some who are the, who who something I'll say that will strike them and I'll say, wow, OK. You know, so so there'll be these little gems that can be dropped mm. in, a, in a, a yoga class. And a lot of my clients for yoga are more mature. You know, they're in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and their bodies are tightened up and, and they like the slow yin yoga kind of approach where it gives their joints time to relax and open. And they're appreciating some of the, the more meditative kind of yoga that I, that I offer. Mm. Um, the younger people, they, they definitely like to move and groove. So get the right music going. And, but I'll try and drop a line in every now and then. That's, that's just to see where it goes. Yeah. Now you got, you got a book there. Um, and uh, was that, <clears throat> is that a, a DVD as well or a CD? Uh, what do we got there? Uh, the book, A Climate is, for Learning. I don't know how that. Yeah, hold it right at. there. Hold it right there. That's good. That's good. Uh, a Climate for Learning. Just put it up a little bit. This is for our TV viewers for the podcast. We'll have a link uh, on uh, the Spotify link and uh, Apple Podcasts. But, um, but it is a teacher's guide to creating an emotionally intelligent classroom in the first four days of school. So uh, when did you write that, uh, Lawrence? I started writing that in 2012 while I was at Taconic High School. I was a math teacher there. And I think I said to you earlier, I kind of was living in spiritual communities until 2006, came back to the classroom. So I taught in two high schools during that uh, seven-year reincarnation of um high school teaching and it was right in the teeth of education reform and mcas and yeah, uh, all yeah. of that um which i still think we haven't really learned uh, our lesson from uh from back then even now because we're still in the midst of it but mm. i digress uh but that's that sort of cross that big contrast you have this uh approach that right. is very deep in eastern spirituality or however you'd like to describe right. it going into the confines of an even more stringent classroom probably than when you uh started in australia yeah and maybe I, I, well you know um there's, there's been a, a big shift. When I went to school, uh, there was a more authoritarian hierarchy mm. where the teacher and the parent would often align and, and use that combined authority to, to influence the kid's behavior. You mm. know, uh, or there was no respite going home and telling mom or dad that uh, the teacher's, you know, a rat bag. <laughs> and, and hoping mom or dad would, would jump onto your side would often backfire. Not happening back in the right? day. No, not, not happening. <laughs> and, and since then, they, you know, they talk about the helicopter parents where now the, the parent is all about uh, doing everything for the kid. Advocating to, for the kid and the teacher, you know. Completely yeah. opposite end of the yeah. pendulum. So teachers uh, and administrators are often um, uh, unwilling to want to intervene and create ripples, which becomes more and more this uh, uh, cut off relationship where it's like, oh, I can't say anything. And if I do, I'm going to get fired, um, et cetera, et cetera. So you, you come, I came back into the school situation with this, this new paradigm and I'm going, whoa, how do I, how do I work inside of, of this new paradigm? And I, I found many um, kids, their only concern was to get the pass, to get mom and dad off the back, get the pass, go to college, get the job. So there was this almost disconnect. Oh, to do that, I actually, I have to work. I have to study. I have to make effort. And I, but can't you just give me an A? Can't you just give me a B? <laughs> 
And so I found this disconnect from the, the work. The whole ethic. concept of negotiating with teachers. I never understood that when I was in great uh, work. You know what I'm saying? Like it's, it's actually fascinating because I would see that in college more than anything. Um, yeah, and right. you'd see, and, and once you get to that level, uh, students would then be going up to the professors and, and having these conversations. Right. I never, I never, uh, I just, came from that old school world in my, at least yeah. in my uh, upbringing was like, Hey, you know, you, you get what you get, but that was a whole education for me uh, seeing that that was happening. And, and that does, that happens this whole, how is this a negotiation? Yeah. <laughs> but there, but, yeah. That's but, a great... but, here, but here we are sometimes, you know? Yeah. So that, 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 that shift has taken place and continues to take place and morphs in different configurations and it is it is different it's it's now you shop for your teacher you look online oh this teacher gets good grades i want my son to get into his or her class and um i won't i won't take no for an answer so there's a there's a there's a there's a, there's a consumerism that's been brought into the education system mm -hmm. uh rightly or wrongly i don't know you know in the who knows where that will evolve right. into and then you throw a school choice into the mix and oh you know oh yeah the, 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 all the leverage uh and and you know again uh, a little digression there but my god uh it, the dynamic, the, the just dynamic to, i mean yeah. to, just to speak very simply you know the dynamic has shifted dramatically yeah. in the last uh two three decades yeah and and so within that there there is intense stress generated by parents who want their kid to get into the right school at the right time uh, and to get the right results. And so this orientation to results creates almost an artificial um, or, or a neglect about the whole process of learning. And the whole process of learning, as most of us like, you know, you want to create a climate for learning where kids want to learn, mm. where they feel safe to learn. Hence the, the title of my book, A Climate for Learning. And that climate has to feel safe. And the first thing I notice is there's a general feeling of not feeling safe in the school. The teachers don't feel safe. Mm. The administrators don't feel safe. The kids don't feel safe. So there's this culture of what have I got to do to get through this period of time in my life right and when you're in a state of fear of the environment that's not conducive to access to learning in the way we're supposed to learn things mm. like academic subjects right when kids go to school hungry when they sort right. of feel like they're in fear all these things are the you know they're the basics and and so we at the very beginning of this interview we talked about the, the power of the mind. And yes, the mind is very powerful. And, and that means you can sort of overcome those uh, even hunger, <laughs> you know, I mean, stories about that uh, historically, how people can overcome the greatest uh, 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 difficulties. However, these are kids and <laughs> they haven't all mastered that. And oh, so, yeah. so obviously, yeah, so when, yeah. so when you have those uh, dis distractions and they're in many cases, more than just distractions, learning how is that even the priority when a kid is going to school hungry exactly and or and feeling unsafe uh, either in the classroom exactly. or in the home uh, for that matter exactly and then the teacher on top of that so you've got this double compounded mm. sense of you know i just want to get home and you know get away from this environment and so a climate for learning a teacher's guide to creating an emotionally intelligent classroom in the first four days of school so after the first couple of years of me kind of trying to figure out who am I, where am I in this system, and do I really want to stay here, I decided I did, and I, but I decided for me to continue as a teacher, I had to change. I had to be somehow different with my relationship to the kids. I had to figure out how do I get into their world, how do I invite them into my world, how do we coexist in the classroom and so this book was born out of this attempt to um 
create an environment in the classroom where the kids felt safe and there was some kind of understanding of what my expectations were that made sense to them. It wasn't just a bunch of rules that were like a foreign language to them. Mm. So the way I figured it is it takes four days to kind of meet understand and develop that relationship so that's four days of not racing ahead with the curriculum mm. we meanwhile my colleagues are kind of shell-shocked like you're not ready yet you you haven't covered this material we're ready to give the first test and i'm and i'm like oh i'm feeling all this tension from my colleagues because my kids are lagging behind right but what I'm trying to develop is I want them to want to come in here and feel like they can find ways to learn and enjoy learning and to develop skills in learning. Mm. So that was my, um, over the next four, six years of teaching, that's what I was trying to hone and a lot of it was unconscious. I wasn't, I didn't have this big master plan when I went into it, but I knew I had to somehow hone it. And this book reflects that time and hopefully condenses it in a way that's very manageable for teachers to pick up the book, read it, hopefully be inspired by it and come up with their own way of developing relationships with the kids in the classroom where the kids and them feel safe with each other. And bringing some, you know, maybe much needed sort of common sense to yeah. the process, because in reality, you're talking about a relationship. Mm -hmm. I mean, you are spending the entire school year with <laughs> these children, these students, yeah. and, you know, you wouldn't, I don't know if, if um, like any relationship, if you had a new boss, you wouldn't expect that the first thing that they were going to do is start you know, running you through, you know, your, your tasks and your responsibilities immediately, you'd want to have a, have a coffee first, maybe, you know, right. for, for the first, very first time you meet uh, that person as an example, you know, um, and I'm sure there's a zillion other examples mm -hmm. of building rapport, building a level of, of trust uh, right. beforehand, uh, before you just get get right into it right, so um, right. so so there is and, and then and there can be and then there are steps within that process right uh, which uh is laid out in that book yeah, exactly and of course with my kind of 20 years of monastic experience i i i knew deeply that a big part of relationships is born out of the being comfortable with silence being comfortable with not knowing and generally as a culture we 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 don't really tolerate those two aspects of our experience we like to fill silence with gibberish we like to just would be better just to keep talking and fill in the space why it is uncomfortable right why it is uncomfortable <laughs> right and the average wait time for a teacher is one second it's being clocked at mm. one second so i ask you a question johnny what's two and two and you your eyes go up and you you're trying to access the information meanwhile the teachers moved on or rolled their eyes or the next kids jumped in and said four and, and there was wow. no there was no comfort with pause and hesitation wow yeah that, that, you know what just that alone is an amazing statistic and an amazing point ah because every every child learns differently. Every human being approaches things differently. You know, Correct. that one second and we have that expectation. Um, it, oh man. Yeah. That's, that's unbelievable. But, but you look on television, Jeopardy is about no time. You, you press that buzzer, buzzer as quickly as you can. <laughs> so we get the kudos that it's all about speed and we miss the fact, no, actually it's about thinking and thinking is a process through time and that's why giving yourself access to thinking time and struggling with nuance and and differences the 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 more the, the intelligence can really come out when you've you've kind of thought through the process rather than have that instant answer that's 
mm-hmm. proving that you're the the best in the class and maybe dipping into a, a, a different part of the brain, you know, because, yeah, you yeah. know, when we're boom, 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 and I'm sure you can tell me which part of the brain that is, but it's like, you know, when we're right at the edge and always listening to the phone and always uh, being distracted, that that's always tapping into uh, probably a more primordial uh, part uh, of the brain. Whereas when you can sit and you can be, you know, um, then you start to get some synapses kicking around in some other parts of the brain. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, that's, uh, you know, it, it's that one second. Jeez. Yeah, I know. Isn't that's that amazing? Unbelievable. Now I, I'll give you one example. I, I, I think I wrote about it in the book, but there was one example. I had a kid, he sat right up the back and, and on the first day of school, you want to really pay attention to where are these kids sitting? And usually a lot of the kids who can't see very well or can't hear very well, we'll sit up the back. (laughs) Believe it or not. Right. So often my first questions will be, um, uh, Mary, can you read what's on the board here? And I've written it quite small and you see them squinting. I say, Mary, I think you're going to have to, for the rest of the year, be a little closer so you can see the boards, you know, so you're trying to help them actually use, (laughs) Because they'll often strategically isolate themselves, mm. thinking they're safer at the back of the room. But there was this one kid who sat up the back every day, never answered a question all year. And I remember just asking one day, um, "What you know? What's ask the question?" And by this time, I've been teaching the kids about meditation, so there's a there's a certain comfort in the room with someone who's slow to answer. And you give them time and you're letting go of judgments. If they don't come up with the answer, it's, it's fine. That's fine. And then uh, 10 seconds pass. And I thought, okay, this is, you know, he's not going to answer. And then I, I just start to, to turn to ask someone else. And he says, wait a moment. And sure enough, another five seconds pass. And he comes up with the answer. And I tell you, that was a moment for me in my teaching career where i just felt it's all been worth it wow the fact that he was taking that long to process the information and all he needed was the space and time and out it came and under normal circumstances in a normal classroom it would have been shut down (sighs) immediately and uh, he wouldn't have even gone even started the process right because the expectation would have been you get the one second or the two seconds That's or right. maybe five tops, but, um, wow. Uh, that it, it's, it's the little things. Oh, That's life. Little things and huge. They're, they're like tips of little of huge icebergs and you go, Oh, wow. So what has to change where kids can ha- feel safe to have that thinking time? Well, we, we have to be respectful of each other. We have to, we have to just be comfortable waiting for that person to have a shot at it. Mm. And just the fact that the person has a shot at it as a teacher, a big part of your obligation is to really thank them for their effort that they took the risk to answer that question. Even if it wasn't the answer I was looking for, the fact that they've taken all that risk is to really support them in the fact that they, they took the risk Mm. rather than "Ah, that's wrong and then move on. Right. To stop dismissing that effort, to encourage them that that effort was worth everything and was as was more important than the right answer. Mm. God, I think <laughs> we can take a deep dive into education someday, but uh, probably be <laughs> way too long, uh, you know, for uh, for today. Did we miss anything, Lawrence? I'm sure there's so much more, but uh, I think we've opened up Pandora's box. Um, (laughs) If there are teachers out there, I, I, I recommend you can download this from Amazon. Yeah. It's, it's definitely an easy read. It's not many words in it. You you'll flick through this in a couple of hours. Uh, I do have a a CD on what's that here. Hold that up. There you go. It's called stillness to greatness. Stillness to greatness. Okay. Um, and that is nine short guided meditations, uh, Lawrence, uh, Carol, tell, tell me about that a little bit. Okay. So you mentioned, and, and people might have flinched earlier where you said, you know, oh, you know, what's, 
if we could find 20 minutes in the morning to get going. So what I, what I, I promise after somebody has a good experience of meditation is let's make this attainable that you can take your practice home and continue it on. And so what I recommend to people is to spend four minutes on practice mm -hmm. for 90 days without missing a day. So I developed these CD, this CD with nine short guided meditations on it. So people could really keep their practice short, experience different types of meditation, choose the ones they like, and know that that, that four minutes, if you commit to it for 90 days, will change something. And when you reach the 90 days, the chances are you'll very naturally up level 10, 12, 20 minutes but it'll be a very natural, easeful progression that doesn't jar your practice. Yeah, because I think the typical 20 minutes that they talk about, I think um, in like trans uh, TMI, is that what it's TM, called? TM, <laughs> Transcendental TM, Meditation. Trans uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, mixing my healthcare and, uh, and meditation. Um, but uh, TM, uh, it, it, they, they say the 20 minutes, but you know, for a beginner, 20 minutes is, is a, is kind of heavy lift. It's a heavy lift unless they're really enjoying the meditation. When I give people the first taste of meditation, I go for a 20 minute lift. And I would say a significant majority come out of it and say, wow, that was 20 minutes. That felt like four minutes to me. Mm. So I try to create an experience of timelessness for them in that guided meditation. And then I say, keep it to four minutes for now. So you know you can do it. Yeah. You know. And, and, and we'll save the conversation on the construct of time for, a, for another okay. Uh, episode. <laughs> yeah, okay. That sounds great. That sounds great. Uh, this has been great, John. Yeah. Lawrence Carroll. Man, it's, it's great to have you. Uh, thanks for coming in. And uh, certainly we'll have all your contact information. But just generally, you know, you're here in the Berkshires. How can people get in touch with you? How can they learn more about uh, what you do every day? Right. Well, this is breaking news. So your listeners are kind of getting it All before right. a lot of other people. Uh, my time in the Berkshires is coming to an end. Uh, Say it ain't so. Oh, my God. <laughs> I am. Are we doing an exit interview? You didn't tell me that. <laughs> well, you know, I didn't know it would come up. Uh, I've been here in the Berkshires for 22 years now. So it's been, a, 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 I would say, a, a formative part of my life. A, a very significant formative part of my my life uh, i am getting a little long in the tooth as they say and uh, my family back in australia who i haven't been able to see for several years because of covid um, they're also struggling with health health issues i just had a, an auntie pass away recently and i'm sorry and so i, I kind of had this sense of calling to to be around family to be around some of my uh, early friendships in these these last years. The good news from my Berkshire residents uh, who turn up religiously to my Zoom yoga classes and meditation classes, I'm going to keep them going. Least, that's the great thing about it. You can still do those. Yeah, and they, <laughs> they never see me in, in the flesh anyway. Yeah. They only see me on the telly. So I'll be <laughs> back in Australia. <laughs> be the same green screen. I'll be just like, I'm right there. Mm. So I, you know, that's been one of the blessings of technology is during COVID I developed a, a lot of my programs via zoom and, and many of my clients just love that convenience. They're home. They can do it from home. They can fit it in. They can um, feel safe and comfortable. And so I've got that going now. So less inside the brick and mortar yoga studios more in, on the screen. So that'll be zoomed live from Oz. Yeah. So Lawrence, <clears throat> going back to Australia and, and, and my gosh, if you don't follow your inner compass, um, then, then what have you learned all these years? Right. Yeah. So I tell you, it's tough, John. I, I've loved the folks in the Berkshires. The, the, uh, the people here have been so embracing uh, my colleagues uh, just, wonderful human beings. Um, it's been very good to me, the Berkshires. And uh, it, there's a great sadness in leaving. And there's this 
this yearning that the next few decades of my life, God bless, you know, if that's true, <laughs> hopefully, uh, will be, uh, there's a calling to return to Oz. And so it's, it's, uh, it's a hard one. Mm. It's not easy for me to straddle those two uh, strong inner connections. Mm. Well, I certainly wish you the very best. And uh, this has been a wonderful time with you. And uh, whether it be Zoom or in person, uh, you're always welcome. And uh, I, I love our conversations. We haven't had, we haven't had uh, too many over the years, no, um, but no, uh, every good. experience I've had with you has been uh, very meaningful. Um, and, uh, and, and I appreciate that. So thank you for that. Thank you, John. Thank you. And thank you to your listeners and viewers. It's, uh, it's great to be here. Thank you.